Welcome everyone to today's uh, weekly research conference, and this is a special session. And uh, but before introducing our distinguished speaker today, I would like to just uh, first recognize that today is Indigenous Peoples Day in Canada on its 25th anniversary. Many of us are very proud to serve our Indigenous peoples and communities in providing health care. From this experience, we rec recognize the resilience, gentleness, artistic talents, and cultural diversity of our Indigenous peoples. We're also privileged to collaborate with our Indigenous researchers, leaders, and communities to understand many of the etiological factors of cardiovascular and chronic diseases and to improve the care and outcomes for our Indigenous uh, peoples, but also for everyone in general. We also recognize and share the history and pain that our indigenous people have endured, but also celebrate their extraordinary accomplishments. By working together and through reconciliation, we realize that after all, we're all one people, sharing time and activities and learning together on this land. Uh, just a few logistics for this um, uh, session. So uh, you can submit your questions using the Q&A features on the bottom of your screen, and they'll be answered at the end of the presentation. We'll be accepting live questions at the end of the presentation. You can use the, the hands up feature and they will be uh, able to be unmuted by the moderator. And if you have any technical issues, use the chat feature and uh, Kelsey or Allison will be able to uh, make sure you can join. And uh, we're absolutely pleased today and uh, uh, privileged to welcome Dr. Emilia Benjamin to our special rounds today. Dr. Amelia Benjamin is a professor of medicine and epidemiology at the Boston University School of Medicine and Public Health and a clinical cardiologist at the Boston Medical Center. It's an urban safety network hospital uh, serving a diverse population. And uh, Dr. Um, Benjamin uh, is also chair for the faculty development and diversity in the Department of Medicine an associate provost for faculty development at the Boston University Medical Campus. She co-designs and co-lead longitudinal faculty development programs for early career, mid-career women and underrepresented racial and ethnic groups. She's a multiple uh, funded PI on five NIH ROIs, focused on uh, atrial fibrillation, mobile health, as well as center for training uh, she is a director of American Heart Association Strategic Focus Research Network on atrial fibrillation, and she's a primary or co-primary network mentor on seven NIH uh, mentored K awards. And uh, she has published over 750 uh, papers, and she has volunteered for the American Heart Association since 1990s, and is the current chair of the AHA Science and Clinical Education Lifelong Learning Committee. She received, the two, just to name a few of awards, she received the 2015 Paul Dudley White Award, 2016 AHA Gold Heart Award, the 2016 Population Research Prize, and 2019 Lenec uh, Clinician Educator Lecturer in the Genomics Precision Medicine, uh, 2019 Distinguished Achievement Award. She was elected to the Association of American Physicians, which is really the ultimate uh, recognition. And also, um, she received the Alliance for Academic Internal Medicine 2020 Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Award. As mentioned earlier, she recognized the value of mentorship, ongoing support of early researchers. And in 2019, she accepted our invitation to join the, the University of Ottawa Heart Institute Research Faculty Mentorship Program in a role of being an international mentor to our rising star, Dr. Jody Edwards. As we are not quite in a position yet to host Dr. Benjamin in person to celebrate her accomplishments and being part of our mentorship circle, uh, we'll welcome her virtually to the Institute and where she will be able to meet with Jody and her local mentors. So we are most privileged that Dr. Benjamin is able to deliver today's special research rounds entitled the Clinical and Research Agenda to prevent atrial fibrillation and its complications. Thank you so much, Dr. Benjamin. Thank you, thank you for that generous introduction. And I wanted to 
state how honored I am to actually present on Indigenous People's Day. That's a, a tremendous honor and uh, really value the, the emphasis on um, diversity, equity, and inclusion and belonging on the part of your institution. It also is a tremendous honor to mentor um, Jody Edwards. Uh, I think like most great mentoring relationships, you just kind of have to get out of the way. And it's been truly admirable to see her extraordinary growth. So um, it's, it's really been a, a joy and a pleasure. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, the research agenda to both in terms of screening and also um, secondary prevention. Um, and part of this is really motivated because I've co-chaired the AF Research Working Group for the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute over the last couple of years. And we, I'm first author on two papers um, in screening and secondary prevention, which is coming out. And we'll be, uh, we've had the webinar and we will be thinking about atrial fibrillation, uh, social determinants, and hopefully publishing that in the next six months. So my learning objectives are to understand emerging approaches to screening for AF, appreciate the opportunities and challenges involved with various screening strategies, and then think about how can we do a better job practicing primordial, primary, and secondary AF prevention and identify the future research directions to advance um, screening and prevention. Um, I was part of this article that was published in 2020 from the Global Burden of Disease that looked at the age standardized disability adjusted life years. And you can appreciate that everywhere we have data, uh, there are issues, but particularly in North America and Western Europe, Australia. And it's estimated that the prevalence is almost 60 million individuals globally are affected by atrial fibrillation. In data from Framingham, published by one of my mentees, Dr. Renata Schnabel, who's now a full professor um, in Germany, uh, we know that the incidence in atrial fibrillation has gone, over the, gone up over the last five decades, and the prevalence has increased fivefold, both in men shown in turquoise and women shown in yellow. And we think that part of that is because of the aging of the population, but this was age adjusted. We also know that people have been surviving longer with both heart disease and with atrial fibrillation, which has increased the prevalence. We also know AF wreaks havoc. We know that there's an increased um, risk of ischemic heart disease, stroke, which is very, very well described, but the five-fold increase in heart failure is really seminal. In fact, Dr. Braunwald literally in 1999 published that the twin epidemics of this coming century were atrial fibrillation and heart failure. And they have a very complex intertwined uh, uh, relationship. We also know there's an increased risk of death and um, all sorts of havoc. We also know in the United States that there are pretty profound social determinants of outcomes. So when we look at the rate of endpoints in AF versus in people of African ancestry versus people of European ancestry, so here's whites, here's black race, um, stroke, heart failure, coronary heart disease, and mortality, we can appreciate compared to their white counterparts, individuals of African ancestry have a higher risk of all these outcomes. We don't think that this is a biologic phenomenon. We think that it is socially determined by various um, inequities and structural racism that is built into our society. Um, it'll be interesting in light of Indigenous Peoples Day to understand more about what your experience in this country has been um, for those who are Indigenous. Um, we also know that regrettably, sometimes atrial fibrillation is first detected after the onset of an ischemic stroke. This is a meta-analysis that's a number of years old, but something like 13% of atrial fibrillation was detected after somebody had had an ischemic stroke. And that's, that's not the place any of us want to be in. Um, there has been su substantial heterogeneity, but I, the preponderance of the evidence does show that, that it, not is, it is not uncommon to diagnose it then. So whenever you have something that can show up with bad outcomes, heart failure, MI, et cetera, the question is, can we get upstream 
and diagnose it earlier and potentially intervene so that we can prevent the complications. So what about screening? Um, there have been multiple studies, including uh, the uh, STOP AF, et cetera, that have looked at this. This is something that was actually published just this year. It was a multi-center randomized controlled care trial of primary care patients where at least 75 had hypertension and did not have atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation was detected by an ECG patch monitor that people wore for two weeks, twice. Five, uh, it was detected in 5.3% by screening versus 0.5% in the control group for a relative risk of 11 fold higher detection rate by routine screening with this patch and an absolute difference of 4.8%. So we know that screening in the appropriate patient population can reveal atrial fibrillation. And if somebody's 75 with CHADS VAS, they would merit anticoagulation. So uh, Tur Turkia and colleagues tried to guesstimate, honestly, what is the proportion of undiagnosed atrial fibrillation in the United States? And they looked at it by prevalence of CHADS II score and um, cost. And what they observed using commercial and Medicare data is that at the time, there was about 5.3 million individuals that had AF, about 700,000 of them were undiagnosed. <clears throat> Most of those undiagnosed had a CHAD score that would merit anticoagulation shown in this figure. And the cost of undiagnosed AFib, they estimated to be about $3 billion in 2014 dollars. So not a trivial amount of atrial fibrillation is clinically unrecognized and undiagnosed. And again, we observe important health inequities. Compared to their white counterparts, individuals who are Black were less likely to be aware that they had atrial fibrillation and disturbingly less likely to be treated with warfarin, which we know prevents stroke. So this was from the REGARD study and um, pretty, pretty ominous um, underdiagnosis in people of African ancestry. So when we think about what do we screen for, whether it's breast cancer, whether it's a CRP or um, colonoscopy, et cetera, there are a lot of criteria that we need to think about. The first is what is the prognosis? There's no sense screening for something if it doesn't make any difference. Most of the data that we have comes from observational studies. This is a study from the UK Clinical Practice Research Data Link. And they looked at people who just showed up and with, for routine follow-up and had incidentally detected atrial fibrillation. And they took the 20, almost 25K of them and age and sex matched them to reference without AFib and followed them for three years, shown here. And you can appreciate individuals who are referenced um, as opposed to those who had incidentally detected atrial fibrillation had a lower likelihood of developing fatal and non-fatal stroke. And so the incident rates were 19, 19 per 1,000 person years versus 8.4 per 1,000 person years. So almost um, 10 per 1,000 person years increase. And interestingly enough, observational data, if they were anticoagulated, they had less risk of developing a stroke. So circumstantial evidence. So exploding onto the scene was the Apple Heart Study, which was a fascinating study published in the New England Journal back in 2019. They were able to enroll almost half a million people in less than a year and collected data quickly. It was a prospective single arm open label study. This is their consort diagram. So 400,000 total population 0.5% had pulse notification. Only 44% of those went on to a first study visit. ECG patch was shipped to 70% and was returned 68%. And what they observed <clears throat> was that the yield on the ECG patch varied by age, not surprisingly, as does the prevalence and incidence of AFib. So in those who wore the, wore the patch for two weeks, individuals that were at least 65 years of age, 35% of them had their AFib verified. 
as opposed to those who are 22 to 39, only 18% of them had their AFib verified on the ECG patch, which of course was not simultaneous with the Apple Watch notification. So um, this was a complicated study and very, very controversial. I'm gonna start with the bad news about this study because I like to always end on the good news. The bad news is a number of limitations that the authors did acknowledge. And these are colleagues. This is, you know, Dr. Perez and Dr. Turkey, a brilliant study and brilliant researchers that a higher than anticipated drop off rate after notification, they ship fewer patches than they planned, which decreased the precision. And importantly, you know, it was a simple study and they relied on self assessment for enrollment criteria and outcomes. So um, Milton Packer being our, our beloved curmudgeon in the United States um, stated uh, unceremoniously, what did the Apple Heart study really find? And he said, based on the results of the Apple Heart study, it's now official. The Apple Watch is a serious competitor for the worst heart device ever. <laughs> and and yeah, there are a lot of complications, a lot of complexities to this. First of all, of those who were screened, only 6% of them were at least 65 years of age. Now, to Dr. Turkia and Dr. Perez's credit, they did not design this as a screening study per se. Um, if you were trying to design a study to, to detect AFib in people that it would change management, you would not start with people who were low risk, right? Um, and and in, in fact, they ended up enrolling an enormous amount of people who essentially were the worried well. Um, and some of these people I'm sure are showing up in your offices. More issues are a sensitivity because they only set patches to those with notification and the Apple Watch is charged at night and we know there's diurnal variability to AFib. We don't know how much AFib they missed. Um, we also know that the precision was overstated. It turns out 15% of those who signed up had prior AFib, which was a protocol violation, which is what happens when you have self-enrollment. They also had a very high dropout rate because only 68% of people returned the patches. Now the author said, well, but it was simple and they're not any harm. They, they, they said basically the exposure to the app was safe. And, and we always need to think about these assertions that screening is safe. Um, this may not be as much of an issue in Canada, but certainly in the United States, um, there, there are real implications with screening. First of all, it wasn't designed as a screening study, so we don't have outcomes. You have to worry about was there false, false reassurance? What percentage of individuals had their AFib missed because of the charging at night, because they didn't wear their watch that day, et cetera? We also know, particularly in the United States, there is a downstream testing and treatment cascade. How many people had their AFib detected and got all sorts of testing? And by the way, in the United States, if you live in Texas, 25% of the people are not insured. So this potentially accrues out-of-pocket costs and you know, potentially a cascade of treatment to what essentially was a low-risk population. And even among those who were at least 65 years of age, of the 3% of people that were notified of the irregularity, only 0.26% had AFib. What percentage of individuals had unnecessarily high anxiety, cost for follow-up, exposure to antiarrhythmics or anticoagulation, or in the United States, ablation with uncertain gain? Um, so, I don't think we can say that exposure to an app was safe. We really, we don't know because that study has not been done. There are also health equity issues. We know that the Apple Watch is, is not tr a trivial expense. It's about $400. And the Apple Watch isn't compatible with Android, although there are Android devices that are. In the United States, I work at an urban safety net hospital. Most patients don't have iPhones. Most of them have Androids. And at least in the United States, there are profound um, inequities by urban, rural, nationally, et cetera, in terms of the percentage of people that are uninsured and household income. And this is where I'm hoping people will raise their hand. I'm going to demonstrate this. See how my hand is raised? I want you to raise your hand if you have had a 
patient present with newly diagnosed device detected AFib? So I'm hoping that people in the um, attendance can raise their hand. This is a huge issue in the United States. Um, so Dr. Liu, Dr. Beanlins, Dr. Chong, I, it's a huge issue where people will come in and they will lovingly show you their six months of blood pressures, their you know, six months of apple tracings, et cetera, um, which, which is quite complicated, right? And in fact, I think this device detected AFib or device detected everything we're on the beach and the tsunami is coming, right? Um, and, and to be honest with you, we, we don't have the workflow to know how to handle this. What do we do? There are no guidelines to tell us. Do we refer to a cardiologist? Do we order a Holter? Do we order a 30-day event monitor, a 14-day patch? Um, and what do we do in terms of duration? What happens if their CHAD flask is one versus two versus um, greater than two? What about duration of AFib? What do we recommend? If it's 30 seconds, 20 minutes, six hours a day, we don't have guidelines because we haven't examined this yet. Um, this, the, the, the device is out ahead of the science. So I would say <clears throat> that if one is asymptomatic and you have a CHADS FASC of two and you have 20 minutes of AFib detected on an Apple Watch, maybe you get a patch and maybe in that two week period you have 20 minutes and you have a 20 minute appointment because in the United States, that's the other thing. You have very short times and you've got to see people in a certain amount of time and you have a 20 minute appointment to have a shared decision making conversation. Tell me how that goes. Um, it's really complicated, right? Because if you in your 20 minute discussion arrive at the decision to anticoagulate and they have a hemorrhage, that's complicated. If you arrive at the decision to not anticoagulate and they have an ischemic stroke, that's complicated. And either way, you are potentially in the United States talking to lawyers um, because of the litigious culture. Again, it doesn't mean that the, the, the plaintiff will prevail, but you spend the next seven years, because this has happened to me, you spend the next seven years of your um, life filling out insurance and, and being deposed by lawyers about cases that should, where there's not really data. So the good news is it increased awareness of AFib. It also was a disruptive technology, which is fascinating. And it's a virtual study design. They were able to enroll 400,000 people from the United States in less than a year. That's the envy of every trialist. And we know that with the five and six, et cetera, there's increased specificity of the Apple Watch. We had a um, in NHLDI workshop to think about screening. And this was a figure put together by my, Ken, uh, my colleague, Dr. Freeman from Australia, who really has done a lot of the thought leadership and is leading the AF Screening International Consortium, trying to get more answers in this space um, and trying to figure out how can we collect the data so we can meta-analyze Canadian, Australian, US, and European, and Japanese studies um, and global studies. But we know that if you have your AFib detected at a single time point, the yield is low, but the stroke risk is high because your burden of AFib must be high if it's detected on such a low screening interval. On the other hand, if you've got consumer driven, we don't even know how many seconds a year, you have a much higher AFib yield, but a much lower stroke risk. And this is something we still need to work out is the, the um, balance between screening intensity and, and what do we do with the data. So in terms of essentially the first half of my talk, where we're at with screen detected, is there, there are a lot of evaluation criteria for novel markers. This was published by my colleague, Dr. Flacke. And we know that proof of concept, yes, screening of AFib detects individuals with and without outcome, outcomes. And it, 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 it does do that. We also know that it can predict, predict events potentially incrementally beyond established screening, but the clinical utility at this point is unclear in terms of changing treatment recommendations. For ECG, yes, because if somebody comes to your office, they have AFib on an ECG, chances are their burden is high enough 
that the AFib was detected. By a smartwatch, we don't know. We don't know clinical outcomes. These studies are um, coming on board and we absolutely don't know if it's cost effective and that really is what needs to happen. We do know, however, that there's variation by race and ethnicity. This was a paper published by my colleague, Dr. Heckberg, um, where they took clinically detected AFib from the MESA study and individuals who were African-American um, were less likely to have clinically detected AFib than their white counterparts, as opposed, and Hispanic and Chinese were more similar. Monitor detected, interestingly enough, not so much. So is there some opportunity to enhance these disparities in AF awareness and detection by different screening algorithms? The jury's out, but this is suggestive. And we certainly need more observational and randomized data to determine who do we target for screening? How intensively do we screen? What device and approach do we use? And what are the individual and health system benefits and risks of screening? And how should screening alter workup and management? What we do know is the screening studies, the vast, vast, vast majority of the participants have been of European ancestry. We've got to change that. We must have more um, diverse. Okay, um, I think Rob has, Rob, are you raising your hand from the vote or are you raising your hand to ask a question? So I will assume if you're not coming off mute that it was to um, say that you'd say, yeah, there we go. Um, and the other thing is we've got to develop the health system so we can deal with all the screen detected AF. We do not have this, not in primary care, not in, which is the point of entry in the United States. We also need to think about, can we prevent AFib and its complications? And again, there's a complexity. We know that the antiarrhythmics have a fairly dismal safety and efficacy stand, um, perspective. Amiodarone is the most effective but at 1,000 days, less than half of people are still in sinus rhythm, and so the law is even worse. Um, and with the um, international uh, uh, cabana study, we know that there was no clear superiority to catheter ablation over drug therapy in the intention to treat analysis. Um, so we, we really are not clear. And, and again, there are issues with ablation <clears throat> because as ablation rates go up uh, in the United States, complication rates go up um, as uh, less experienced operators are doing ablations and probably higher risk patients are doing ablations. So this is as an area of concern. Um, so ideally, what we'd like to do is prevent AFib in the first place. You know, that old adage, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And the first thing that an epidemiologist thinks about is primordial prevention. How do you prevent the emergence of risk factors rather than treating them after the fact? And there's some interesting data, some from Framingham and other places where we know that individuals who are obese compared to their underweight, overweight, um, counterparts in green and normal weight in blue are more likely to have atrial fibrillation and follow up than you know, their normal weight counterparts. But I want you to notice, when do the curves start to separate? The curves do not start to separate until four to six years of follow up. Think about that when you're thinking about the design of the average clinical trial, whether sponsored by industry or sponsored by governmental agencies. We also know that sedentary lifestyle increases the risk of atrial fibrillation about two and a half fold. And this has been um, proven by meta-analyses and all observational studies. Probably unethical to randomize people to couch potato versus exercise. <clears throat> We also know that compared to individuals who have optimal risk factors shown in the most saturated colors, those who have borderline intermediate color or elevated least saturated color um, have a higher risk of atrial fibrillation in follow-up or less AFib survival free of AFib, um, whether they are white, black, 
white men or black men. So the higher the elevation of the risk factors, the less likely one is to be AF free and follow up. <clears throat> okay, so say the risk factors have emerged and you're seeing them in your primary care, what do we do? Well, the first question you know, is, we know that there's an obesity epidemic. We think that it's driving some of the AFib epidemic. What about metabolic surgery? We know this is observational data. We know from Cleveland Clinic data and other studies that those who were versus non-surgical controls, those who had metabolic surgery were less likely to have incident atrial fibrillation than um, their metabolic surgery counterparts. And again, the curves don't start to separate until three years. And in fact, with the procedure, there may be a little bit increased risk of atrial fibrillation incidentally. This is the study that broke my heart, uh, the Diabetes Look Ahead randomized controlled trial. And this took a um, intervention, um, people who got uh, aggressive lifestyle if they had type two diabetes and did not. This was a secondary um, endpoint, but people who are post hoc analysis, people who did not have AFib and had type two diabetes, they were randomized to intensive lifestyle versus you know regular care. There was 294 incident AFibs, those who had lifestyle had 6% AFib versus those who had usual care um, had 3.5%. It was not statistically um, significant. Um, so a null study. We do know from the SPRINT, again, a se secondary analysis, we do know that those randomized to intensive systolic blood pressure treatment were less likely to have incident AFib rather than those who had standard systolic blood pressures and the hazard ratio was 0.74 and an absolute difference per thousand person year follow-up of about two. Interestingly enough, there's been a lot of dietary interventions and they're kind of all over the map. This is one that shows nuance at AFib after omega-3 versus corn oil. And if anything, there's an increased risk of atrial fibrillation, those randomized to omega-3 um, supplements as opposed to corn oil. So, you know, we have to stop and say, well, <laughs> the primary prevention studies really have been a, a bit of a mess. Um, and, and, and why is that? And part of it is this kind of event mismatch, mismatch, you know, a, you know, a little bit of, you know, AFib, a little heart failure, MI, they're following multiple endpoints. Um, the, and, we also know that the follow-up duration of the average trial is only about two years, one year, 18 months, maybe three years. A very long trial would be four years. And curves typically don't start to separate with lifestyle and primary prevention until farther in for AFib. A huge issue plaguing this whole field is the look back phenomena. Most of these were post hoc analyses. That's a problem. We also know that clinical trials are extremely expensive. And, and so that's been a problem because we haven't had enough primary prevention studies, unlike um, in the space of coronary heart disease and heart, um, where we've had a lot more primary prevention studies. But I would say, given the AFib epidemic, you know, at a minimum, it's critical. Everybody who's doing clinical trials, please pre-specify AFib as a secondary outcome. If you have people, you're including people, uh, you know, ages 65 or above, AFib is a very simple, very cheap endpoint to adjudicate and you will contribute to the evidence. And the other question is, can we take people who have very high risk of atrial fibrillation and can we think about randomizing those people to more aggressive primary prevention. What about secondary prevention? Well, the data is you know, completely incontrovertible for stroke. This is data um, published years ago. Um, and obviously we know that warfarin versus placebo is associated with a lower risk of stroke, a prevention of um, less uh, mortality at the cost of major bleeding. So 68% risk reduction. So that's pretty fundamental. And we know that compared to warfarin, DOAX in people that are eligible have less risk of stroke um, than their counterparts on warfarin. So we have a lot of therapies. But the problem with the secondary prevention space in atrial fibrillation is 
almost all of the oxygen in the room has been sucked in by stroke prevention. That's a problem. And, and part of the reason why it's a problem is, you know, when you look at in Medicare data, this is a study we did with Leslie Curtis, Susan Hepper, um, Dr. Pacini and myself, where we looked at people and said, you know, follow them for five years. What is the most common event, their first event? MI, then GI bleed, then the next most common event was stroke. The most common event was death. And actually, heart failure was a much more common event than stroke, but we have virtually no heart failure prevention studies. And that's a problem and, and really an unmet need for people who are interested in clinical trials. So what do we know? A lot of non-randomized data. This is um, uh, Prash Sanders and uh, colleagues out of Australia have published most of this literature. We know that versus aggressive blood pressure control, um, people that were randomized to um, control were less likely or, or more likely to have AFib in follow-up or less likely to be AF-free in follow-up than people um, who had their risk factors aggressively controlled and the hazard ratio was fivefold. So aggressive risk factor control is indicated from non-randomized data. Again, non-randomized data, meta-analysis of CPAP um, suggests that those who, um, whether they had a PVI or didn't have a PVI, those that were treated with CPAP and sleep disordered breathing, less likely to have recurrent AF. Um, honestly, the, the primary, CPAP um, for primary prevention of AF, the studies have been so tiny that really not worth commenting on. Um, and we have a little bit of randomized data. So the most impressive study that exploded onto the scene almost a decade ago was a single center partially blinded randomized controlled trial by Dr. Sanders and colleagues out of Australia. And they randomized people to aggressive weight loss if they had a BMI over 27 and were waiting around for an ablation. And they got weight management and lifestyle. And those who were randomized um, here were had better symptoms, lower symptom burden in follow-up than the controls, had fewer episodes of AFib, and had a cumulative duration of AFib that was lower than those who were randomized control. So this is a very important study that says weight loss should be part of our armamentarium. There also is a post hoc analysis of the um, SGLT2 inhibitors. It seems like, uh, <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe SGLT2 is gonna be the new statin where like it seems to be the wonder drug. Um, but as a post hoc analysis, dapagliflozin apparently had an effect on cardiovascular events for a TIMI 58. And um, for AFib, it looks like there was a significant reduction for both incident and recurrent AFib or 19% reduction um, in those who uh, were randomized to dapagliflozone. So stay tuned. I think there'll be a lot more with the SGLT2 inhibitors. And another study that I think has not gotten sufficient attention, attention is a study um, published again by uh, Australian colleagues, Vasco Buenik and colleagues who did a randomized controlled trial of aggressive alcohol abstinence versus control. Again, the probability um, of uh, no recurrence of AFib, so survival free. And compared to the controls, those who were abstinent were less likely to have recurrent atrial fibrillation and had less time in AFib. And this is something that really, frankly, we're not doing in both EP clinics or in primary prevention. And we aren't also taking, just say, forget the AFib, most individuals with AFib have other evidence-based therapies they should be receiving based on the fact that, you know, they have hypertension or they have heart failure, et cetera. Something like 93% have at least one evidence-based therapy that's guideline directed, and among those only half received all of the indicated therapies. So this is Orbit AF data, National Registry data. We, we need to be doing a better, a better job as secondary prevention. So when we thought about AF you know, from our workshop that's in press, the first thing we said is we've got to increase the diversity of outcomes. We have to stop only focusing on stroke prevention in AFib. Um, there's a huge opportunity with, with 
heart failure, with cognition, with quality of life, with hospitalization cost, et cetera. We also need to increase the diversity of participants. Almost all of the secondary prevention studies have been um, of individuals of European ancestry. So in terms of the multiple outcomes, we need to expand to heart failure, MI, emboli, renal, quality of life, frailty, pa you know, patient reported outcomes, death. Um, and we also need to look at process outcomes such as utilization, testing, and dollars and health system in terms of sort of, and, and in patient reported outcomes in terms of anxiety and complications. So we need to expand the outcomes that we're looking at. Um, and this has not received any attention. We also need to, at least in the United States, think about clinician liability and workflow as we do more screening, et cetera. We also know that it, in the clinical literature, there is a vast underreporting and underrepresented representation of AF um, diverse populations. So in terms of underreporting, um, for participant level racial and ethnic data, something like oh, 15 of the trials were not, didn't even publish race, ethnicity um, compared to 19. And of those that did the underrepresentation of, um, or the overrepresentation of people of European ancestry versus African American, Hispanic, and Asians was, was pretty profound in the United States compared to their proportions in these census. So that, that's a problem. Um, and we also need to think about, you know, what is the role of M Health to enhance prevention? Potentially, we can target risk factors. You know, patients, we know post pandemic, patients don't want to be running to the hospital every five minutes to get their blood pressure monitored, their um, diet controlled, their weight, et cetera. Can we be using M Health for more targeted risk factor management? home cardiac rehab, home blood monitoring, home sleep apnea, et cetera. Um, and can we be using this for health promotion and prevention, disease detection and, and management, and also frankly, looping in family networks and medical teams so that we have more effective and efficient patient care. Um, the other question and a huge future research direction that's another part of my, my research is, can we use precision medicine to stratify targets for screening and prevention. This is a study that was published um, from Framingham by my colleagues, Dr. Wang and Dr. Lubix um, and myself, where we looked at individuals who had low polygenic risk versus high intermediate polygenic risk, for intermediate versus high polygenic risk. And we splayed them by high clinical risk in the most saturated versus low in the least saturated color. So those who were low clinical risk and low polygenic risk um, were, only had a 22% lifetime risk of AFib. If you look at those who were at high clinical risk and high polygenic risk, 50% lifetime risk. So maybe we can be using both clinical and polygenic risk to help separate people that we should be thinking about screening and more aggressive prevention targets. Um, so, you know, could we use an AF genetic risk score and potentially a, a, you know, clinical risk score to take individuals without AF high clinical and I would say genetic risk score and, and screen, do a randomized trial to screen them. Um, so we have a atrial fibrillation center grant from the American Heart Association and we have a precision medicine component, which is to identify new AF pathways, um, which is sort of uh, taking GUI, exome, sequencing data, et cetera. Um, we also are, have a stratified medicine where we are taking um, people who've had ischemic strokes and trying to splay them by their clinical risk. If we feed back their clinical and potentially genetic risk, can, does it change management and does it prevent outcomes and people have ischemic stroke but have not had their AFib diagnosed? And my colleague, Dr. Trinkert, is leading the population health to, again, refine our polygenic and clinical risk scores, both for AFib and its complications, looking at data from multiple cohort studies in the United States. Another huge unmet need in the United States 
is understanding the gaps in relations of social determinants of health to AF diagnosis, evaluation, treatment, and outcomes, whether it's education access, economic stability, social and community context, neighborhood and built environment, and healthcare access. And uh, we are in the process of submitting a grant. We will see, you never know. Um, but hopefully we will be looking at this further to understand how do social determinants of health influence both processes and outcomes in atrial fibrillation so that we can get at some of these profound health inequities and racial inequities, ethnicity inequities in AFib processes and outcomes. So that's been a whirlwind tour of what I've been thinking about over the last five years. And, and the first thing that I want to summarize is we know AFib may first be detected at stroke onset, also at heart failure onset. We, we, we also know that screen detected is associated with increased risk of stroke and death. We don't know how to manage screen detected AFib. That will be emerging over the next decade. Um, we also know that we need to have better programs and research to help us do primordial, primary, and secondary AF prevention. The observational data already amply supports healthy lifestyle, which you would say we need to do anyhow for both you know, AFib, heart failure, cardiovascular disease, cancer prevention. We know that randomized controlled data supports anticoagulation, and we have emerging randomized data that supports weight loss interventions and alcohol abstinence. We need more data to really start a secondary prevention agenda given the adverse outcomes in AFib. And I want us to also be thinking about what is the future of precision public health for AFib? How do we diversify the participants, outcomes and settings where we're doing AFib research, where we can do it more in the home, more in communities, et cetera? How do we refine our screening algorithms? How do we intensify, who do we intensify primary and secondary prevention? And how can we determine and mitigate social determinants of health? So with that, I'd like to thank all the people that, um, the first thing I should do is start out with um, thanking all the people that I've talked into doing research grants with me um, to look at atrial fibrillation, including Leslie Curtis, Patrick Eleanor, Steve Lubitz, um, and Ludovic Turnicker and Kathy Lunetta. I would also like to thank um, my colleagues and mentees who, you don't get 750 papers because you write a lot of papers, you get 750 papers because you you're a great judge of talent. And I um, like Dr. Hoff, uh, uh, you know, Dr. Edwards, she had me at hello. I knew she was great talent and, and am honored to be part of her mentoring team. And uh, with that, I will take questions. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much. Uh, I think that's uh, really a testament of really the breadth and the depth of the work that you're doing. And uh, this is such an important uh, public health issue, you know, really uncovering a lot of uh, kind of uh, uh, probably, you know, hidden risks that's not recognized before, whether it's from clinical trials, you know, or from mm -hmm. uh, the uh, public health uh, point of view. But, uh, you know, really uh, very exciting times as well, you know, in terms of the yeah. technology, you know, sort of a new understanding and uh, the ability for us to, uh, you know, integrate the new tools uh, to, uh, you know, collect the evidence so we can actually change the trajectory. Yeah. Well, so I hope you sit on my study section because one of the things that we, we're putting in a revision on social determinants of health and one of the reviewers said, why AFib? It's not important. <laughs> so... <laughs> Get so, out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just to say, just to say, no, I, I, your, your mentees and your colleagues need to hear that because somebody can be very well funded. It doesn't mean they don't get, you know, roughed up a study section. <laughs> but it's like, AFib not important. Oh, oh my God. Okay. <laughs> Where's that person being all these years? Yeah. Yeah. So, was, was, you have to have a sense of humor. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, I'll turn it over to uh, Jody uh, to uh, host. Uh, q a session yeah jody go ahead it looks like rob has his hand up um while jody's yeah. coming uh, rob go ahead yeah so make sure jody's on yes great yeah amelia thank you that was a brilliant brilliant presentation thank you and i really appreciate um also your sense of humor to that that came through which is really hard to do over zoom i must yeah. say because you don't 
you don't have the audience uh, feedback, but we were laughing along with you when you raised uh, some of those uh, those interesting points. So um, anyways, thank you so much for coming uh, and for your help with uh, Jody as well, of course. Um, so I had a question about, you, you talked about the racial differences, which uh, definitely that first slide was quite um, impressive. Um, I do wonder about how that links with the social determinants of health and whether, it, and, and you kind of alluded to this on one of the other slides, but how much that racial, those racial differences are related to that or linked to that. Uh, is it possible to, to separate those out, um, not just for AF, but for the other, other um, diseases that you were uh, uh, linking that to? Yeah, that, that is a, a fabulous question. And it, frankly, it's it's our we got <clears throat> 31st percentile on our AFib and social determinants grant, and we are mounting what we hope is a uh, an effective revision. Um, it, it, so, you know, there, there's a huge complexity with social determinants of health. And there's there's an issue about what is race, what is place, right? And and what are social systems? And um, one of the things I didn't have time to talk about it, but but in, in AFib, one of the fascinating things is for most conditions, um, the <clears throat> cardiovascular conditions, they're diagnosed more frequently in people of African ancestry, at least in the United States. And that's because of the higher burden of risk factors. And the first time I saw the data emerge that people of African ancestry were less likely to be diagnosed. I was like, yeah, that's just ascertainment bias. That's just rank racism, right? I just assumed that's what it was. Literally, there have been probably 50 dozens and dozens and dozens of studies with different study designs that have shown differences in the detection, which is, is a little odd given the higher preponderance of risk factors in people of African ancestry. And in fact, there's one study that I was involved with, Dr. Marcus is the lead author, where um, we looked at ancestry informative markers. And the more European ancestry one had, the more likely one is to be diagnosed with AFib. Having said that, when you look at more careful screening studies, there are not those same inequities. And I, I personally think, and, and it'll probably, people of African ancestry probably are less genetically predisposed to AFib. Um, than their white counterparts, but we don't know. And that's, you know, that's sort of a third rail in the United States practicing racialized medicine. What we do know is that once people of African ancestry get it, they are, have um, profound disparities in terms of the evaluation, in terms of the treatment and in terms of the outcomes. And we don't think that that's race-based. We are convinced that that's based on structural racism and um, social determinants of health that we that we need to address in the United States, and probably, frankly, globally. Most most countries. I mean, you know, people always talk about the race problem in the United States. You know, trust me. You know, we don't we don't completely corner the market on race and ethnicity issues, um, but it's it's much more obvious and rank because of the original sin of slavery. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, definitely, it's. It's not a unique problem to the states for sure. Um, we're seeing that more and more in Canada for sure, as it rears its ugly head. Yeah. Well, it's it's like if if you if you turn on the flashlight, you see things that you don't want to see. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I think uh, Dr. Lou. Yeah, so um, a comment and uh, a question. Yeah, so uh, absolutely, um, you know, so I'll be happy to uh, join the uh, NHLBI review panel to uh, do justice. Uh, so the, uh, but uh, the way that, uh, you know, having actually learned a lot uh, working with Jody Edwards and uh, our colleagues, uh, you know, uh, interesting atrial fibrillation that I actually regard atrial fibrillation uh, is kind of on the intersection of multiple uh, component you know, cardiovascular pro uh, problems. And uh, so, you know, so I, I think it's a kind of a situation in, in the atrium, it's actually part of a convergence of risk factors impact. It actually uh, has intersection with the ventricle. And that's why, you know, there's a crosstalk with the uh, heart failure. Uh, it actually, you know, uh, intersect uh, a lot with a uh, metabolic syndrome. You know, that's why the obesity, uh, diabetes, 
uh, and the area that Jody is very interested in is actually in terms of uh, cerebral, you know, sort of a complication, not just stroke, but cognitive impairment. So I really actually regard, you know, it's kind of the sentinel nexus, right? You know, all these processes. Yeah, so anyone who think atrial fibrillation is not important, <laughs> kind of missing the whole, uh, the, the, <laughs> the, the, the real gold in this. But uh, my question is, uh, and again, this is something that, uh, again, Jody kind of uh, taught me, that is that, uh, uh, in fact, it's almost uh, like a uh, atrial myopathy uh, in a way, you know, with the genetic environment uh, factors. And uh, so I know Jody is interested in, for example, you know, looking at atrial size, you know, which, uh, you know, with pocket echoes, you know, be become easier. And I've been interested in biomarkers, you know, and the things like even like uh, NT-pro BNP high central proponent, you know, we quite often think of those as uh, kind of a ventricular marker, but it turns out that they are excellent, you know, in predicting, you know, atrial fibrillation and atrial fibrillation risk, you know, really underscoring the fact that, uh, you know, it's a, a myopathy at the end of the day as well. So I was wondering whether one could, uh, you know, sort of bring into the fold of uh, the, you know, the targeted, uh, you know, for example, prevention uh, in which you already have, uh, you know, sort of a lot of the risk factors that one can actually bring in some of these considerations so that one can, you know, sort of uh, have uh, a better identification of high risk individuals and that, uh, you know, when one, for example, have uh, intervention, you know, can really actually demonstrate the uh, magnitude of impact. Uh, yeah. just as Excellent, excellent question. So um, we we published the, the I think most widely used risk prediction. We when I, I got together with a challenge grant and talked some of my competitors into doing a grant with me, and uh, which just goes to show everybody listening that you know if you cooperate and you and you have um, you're very collegial, you end up publishing a lot more and you have a lot of fun. So I talked my collaborators, my competitor slash collaborators into doing a grant with me, and we published a risk prediction instrument. Um, that's fairly widely used. Um, so clinical factors predict if you add on BNP, it, it increases the C statistic actually fairly significantly, like, you know, two actual percentage points, which is fairly unusual for C statistics and reclassification and genetic markers do as well. Um, the issue about imaging is it's expensive. Um, and so, you know, you probably won't be doing widespread imaging. I think at some point we may end up doing a natriuretic peptide or, you know, it probably, you know, uh, probably, you know, whole genome sequence on everybody because um, the cost going to be so cheap. Um, I don't know about the imaging. Um, Dr. Edwards, what you had a question. Yes, thank you so much for your talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, I'm going to build a little bit on uh, Peter's question as some of the things that I've been interested in this in this area. Um, I couldn't agree more in terms of broadening out beyond stroke um, in terms of our outcome assessment. And I, as you know, my program really focuses on cognition and, and other types of outcomes and more and more heart, as Peter indicated, kind of integrating heart failure into the picture as well as a real kind of you know, spectrum and continuum of, of the disease from cardiopathy forward. And so what I, I did want to um, ask you just in terms of, um, you know, the tools that you've been developing in terms for risk prediction and for stratification, um, I'm more and more interested in trying to kind of work with some of the um, the newer joint effects models, because I find some of the initial uh, risk prediction tools, they're just so, you know, there's, you know, a, a number of, of predictors, but mapping really onto only one outcome, and it, and it ends up being a little bit simplistic in, in scope for some of these patients that we're seeing. And I, I wondered if you're starting to exploit some of these um, joint effects modeling as well, and trying to integrate that into your prediction, um, you know, kind of into your program for prediction modeling. Yeah, so we are certainly when it comes to social determinants of health. Um, because, you know, you cannot isolate, oh, I'm just going to, you know, educate, everything is so interrelated, mm -hmm. um, at least in the United States, that is, you know, and, and most of it, so that's part of where we're going. Um, in, in terms of the, the, I think probably one of the areas that's been underutilized is risk prediction of bad outcomes after the diagnosis of AFib. For instance, I, 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 the, the question is, if you, if you predict multiple outcomes at the same time, how do you prevent multiple outcomes at the same time? If, if what you wanna do is come up with a patient population or, uh, or participants where you can really hone in on, okay, you've got a very high risk of heart failure, let's then do clinical trials to prevent the emergence of your heart failure. You're gonna be more likely to um, come up with a strategy that will be successful than if you're trying to prevent multiple outcomes at a time. At least that's my thought. But um, certainly that in terms of a patient, you know, uh, 
you know, they, they don't, they, they don't, they, they think a whole panoply. They don't just think about their stroke. They think also about their cognition, et cetera. I personally think that one of the most hugely underrepresented areas in AFib research is cognition. Um, and I am convinced that in the next decade, there's going to be an explosion of cognition research, um, as it should be because of the, of the really important link. What we don't have is great randomized data, how to prevent the cognitive problems. Um, that come with AFib. And that is, is really, we have a lot of observational data, a lot of, I, I actually just was reviewing it this weekend because I foolishly agreed to, agreed to give a talk even though I'm not an expert on it. And so I was reviewing the literature and I'm, it's, pretty, it's pretty shocking how many meta-analyses have been done and the quality and how much heterogeneity, you know, the eye statistics are crazy because they're, you, you know, it's, it's, it's like the Tower of Babel out there, right? Um, so we certainly need to have more um, robust observational data. And we also need to have more, we need to start doing clinical trials. Thank you. Thanks for that. Those were great questions, by the way. Thank you. This is an honor. And again, I wanted to honor Indigenous Peoples Day. That, that's really, you know, really very moving to me that I happened to luck out to be able to talk on that day. Uh, yeah, I just want to, uh, you know, sort of, uh... Uh, thank uh, uh, Amelia again, you know, for an un uh, unbelievably inspiring talk, you know, it's really actually, you know, so well timed and bringing in a lot of relevant, uh, uh, you know, uh, features, uh, not only in terms of atrial fibrillation, but, you know, broader cardiovascular disease and uh, the social determinants, you know, on indigenous day, exactly as you mentioned. And, uh, but uh, particularly thank also uh, Jody uh, Edwards, you know, for doing so much work in this area and help to actually attract <laughs> Dr. Benjamin, you know, to our mentorship circle. And so this is a you know, great honor. And uh, so look forward to, yeah, so look forward to, uh, you know, working with you, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Benjamin and, uh, you know, certainly, um, you know, a great collaboration uh, with Jody and the, our Heart Institute as well. And all the best to your, uh, 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 grant application, which is yes. most deserving of a top rank uh, score. Yes, yes. <laughs> I hope nobody's on my study section because I probably just got triage. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Amelia, so much. Thanks so much. Thank you. Take care. Yeah.